Hello world! Inspired by the video by Captain Disguise on Egypt and a Pharaoh, I pulled out a project which I had shelved for a year or so as it stems from a translation cooperation with A.T. Ku, who thus deserves all credit due. Creating the video is quite tricky, multi-level and requires a lot of legwork. I will look into the claims made in the Quran and the subsequent justifications made by Muslims and one of my favorite frauds, Dr. Maurice Bouquet, surrounding a name in the Quran, Haman. What most people here have probably seen is the video from the miracle factory Harun Yahya. The claim is that Haman was commissioned in his capacity as close advisor to Pharaoh, well, a Pharaoh, or even being part of the court of a Pharaoh to build a tower reaching heavens. This Haman is mentioned six times in the Quran, and Captain Disguise does an outstanding job of identifying the inconsistencies around a Pharaoh, the Pharaoh, or just Pharaoh, as is mentioned in the Quran, where he is called Firun. From the video of Captain Disguise, we know that the attributes of Pharaoh of the Bibles in the Quran is just as fictitious as is Moses himself. But what about Haman? The only Haman I have come across is in the biblical book of Esther, where he is placed into Babylon, and roughly a thousand years after the Pharaoh associated with Moses to build, well, a tower. It seems the authors of the Quran once again mixed up stories, unless Bukay is right, of course. The video and the various Muslim Dawah sites all copy the same nonsense and parrot the lies of Bukay. I will try here to show why I call this nonsense and outright lies. And, and just when I thought I was incredibly clever when researching some background, I came across a site answering Islam where a Jochen Katz debunks the entire story in great detail and with more knowledge than I have. But I was already halfway through this, so I took some of the findings, included them here, and decided to finalize this in video format. I don't agree in every detail with their findings, especially the conclusion. In his 1995 book, Moses and Pharaoh, the Hebrews in Egypt, Bouquet claims that he has unraveled the mystery and he can prove that Haman existed as a close advisor to the Pharaoh. And this is what Muslims consider to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They go and spend a lot of time disassembling the biblical account in Esther, showing how it can't be trusted, and that this makes their own version the correct one. Then they show in great detail how the Rosetta Stone has enabled us to decipher hieroglyphs, unfortunately overshooting the mark by claiming that all hieroglyphic orthography is known, which is not true. They follow Bouquet's story without really adapting to reality, which, as some research shows, they are fully aware of. As I don't have access to the book itself, I will use the excerpts as found on the page by Jochen Katz and islamicawareness.org. But they cite the book and try to prove the claims as being correct. So let's go to the beginning. What Bouquet claims? Well, if you look in the Quran, it is written like this, which is Aha, Alif, Mim, Alif, Nun. The doorpost starts with this H and the Quran starts with this age. This will be important later on. So we have the consonants ha, a mim, and a nun plus two vowels. The ha in Arabic is pronounced similar to the English H in hat. The Egyptian hieroglyph, however, is pronounced more like the Arabic version of ch. So it is not a perfect transliteration. And a perfect transliteration does not exist anyway, as any linguist should know. Similarly, the Egyptian hieroglyphs do not show any vowels, so we have HMN, which could mean anything from Haman or Himon to Homuni. The hieroglyphic orthography is not perfectly known today, as there are some letter combinations which still elude us. So all we have so far is a match consisting of two letters, the M and the N. I find this statement extremely weird, given that Muslims love name dropping. Here, Bouquet magically comes up with an unknown expert of everything without naming her or him, without showing what exactly makes this expert an expert and in what field. No references to papers or credentials, just a prominent Egyptologist. <laughs> and this is the second expert Bouquet claims to have consulted with, but I would imagine that no renowned expert would associate herself or himself to an endeavor such as this. I also think that Bouquet simply invented these experts to boost his credibility. 
and reading up on the topic will show that I am not alone with this impression. Well, if you have an expert in classical or ancient Arabic, she or he should not really be surprised to see a page from the Quran. In every field you have standard or reference works. Hermann Ranke is one of them. If someone claims to be an Egyptologist and needs to be pointed to Ranke, it immediately disqualifies him from knowing anything about the topic. Anyone even remotely interested in Egyptology knows Ranke. In addition, the book he quotes does not exist. Whoops. Bouquet is so desperate to get Haman into the era of Ramses and Remta of the 19th dynasty, the New Kingdom period of Egyptian history which ended roughly 1200 BCE, commonly associated with Moses, that he invents a title. The title he presumably refers to is a book by Haman Ranke called the Die Egyptischen Personennamen, the Egyptian names, covering roughly 3000 years of Egyptian history, which consists of several volumes, but none with any suffix resembling New Kingdom. What is actually comical is what happens when this is copied to websites, as Islamic Awareness and Harun Yahya copy the same spelling error along with everything else. The same applies when Hermann is suddenly spelled with an E at the end as Hermanner. Now, this could be coincidence that two people put an E or a space in exactly the same place independently of each other, but yeah. And a French expert referring to German transliteration as opposed to a French transliteration? <laughs> well, as anyone with only cursory knowledge of hieroglyphic transliteration knows, there is no language-based transliteration. They are standardized, as anyone can see in the attached references. As we will see later, Bouquet had every reason to be stupef stupefied, as he could not possibly read the profession there. Ranke writes no such thing. There is no mention of any profession, just the name, the description, Hetep. Oh, Hetep. Bouquet claims the inscription is on a stele. It is not. It is on a piece of a doorpost. Bouquet then claims the inscription is in the Kaiserlich Königliches Hofmuseum in Vienna. It is not. It is found in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. It changed its name decades ago, after Austria lost its monarchy in 1918, something he would have obviously seen had he been there. Ranke did not consider these signs to be determinatives because he transcribed them. The curator of the Egyptian Oriental Collection, Michaela Hüttner, checked the records and found no visitor or correspondence with any bouquet, inquiring to see the doorpost before it went on public display in 1996, after bouquet's book came out. Before that, the, the, the doorpost was kept in the museum storage. Bouquet claim, claims the inscription emphasizes an intimate of a pharaoh. It does not. The description refers to a god, the gracious falcon god Hermen. Harun Yahya and his fairy tale factory have changed their pages on Haman over the years, toning down the claims, but they keep some hilarious ones. A single inscription on a doorpost magically evolves into inscriptions and a fragment of a doorpost becomes a monument to Haman and they copy the error in the museum's name. On another page, Yahya claims that Haman is mentioned in the Gospels. Really? Where? They also say that the name in the Old Testament refers to a Babylonian king who lived 1100 years after Moses. The real difference is more like half that and they confuse the contents with when the book of Esther was written. Sloppy. In another section, the collective brain power of Harun Yahya Dreamworks come up with yet another claim. The single inscription now grows into an entire collection of inscriptions, and this, as well as the job description, is based on the book People in the New Kingdom. Uh, really? That the meaning of hieroglyphs was forgotten does not automatically mean that the stories went missing as well. They could well have been handed down orally. There once was a guy who was commissioned to build a gigantic tower all the way to the stars for a big king. Hmm. My version of the story goes as follows. Bouquet and Zindani have set themselves the task of proving that a Haman as mentioned in the Quran existed. They contact some Egyptologists to ask if anyone knows a Haman. They don't. Someone guides them to Ranke. They look for a name resembling Haman in the books by Ranke and don't find any Haman. The only name Bouquet manages to identify is a HMN-H, 
which, in his ignorance, is as close as he wishes. In addition, the last H is marked with a question mark. What BK, Yahya and Islamic Awareness are saying, well, surely, even if Anka says it's an abbreviation of something, you can just drop the H and voila, you have HMN as desired. Now you just add the vowels you require, ignore the diacritical marks and you get the required result. Haman. As the entry also refers to Vreshinsky, he goes off and finds Vreshinsky's book Egyptische Inschriften aus dem Kaiserlich Königlichen Hofmuseum in Wien. Now, here he finds a lot of information, which should actually have stopped any further investigation in this direction, but he chooses to ignore this and build a false construction based on what he finds. Well, he is after all now clutching at straws as he has nothing else to go on. If we go back to the Ranke entry briefly, we see that he draws the hieroglyphs consisting of the V28, the Y5, the N35, the F18 and the Y1, and then you get the pronunciation from the Gardner list in the link. Now, Ranke here quite rightly points out that the pronunciation of the H is a so-called emphatic H, which corresponds neatly with the Gardner list. He therefore marks the H's with a dot underneath it. In the Quran, we have the, the normal age, the alif, the mim, the alif, and the final nun. Now, how does this correspond to the hieroglyphs? Well, only the mim and the nun are comparable, the rest is not. The one of the three possible H sounds in Arabic is different. So much for perfect transliteration. But now we come to the second part of the name inscribed on the doorpost. Ranke writes that HMN-H originates from an artifact in Vienna, refers to Vreshinsky and adds in footnote 2 that this could be an abbreviation, very common in hieroglyphs hewn out of stones. Just underneath that entry he shows what the abbreviated inscription could mean. Chemen is merciful. Chemen being the Egyptian falcon god. Just above the entry he also refers to the god Chemen, who is great. So all three entries on this page refer to a god and his attributes, marked as a hyphen and the description, not a determinative which can be dropped. No mentioning of any Haman, Pharaoh's vizier, who is the chief builder. None of that can be found here. So we have so far an entry in a book which was unknown to acclaimed Egyptologist, is being relabeled by Muslims, confirmed by an unnamed French expert with a name that hardly resembles the name of the Quran and refers to a god. It's not looking good so far. But let's resume with Vreshinsky. His entry I-34 is a Pfeiler einer Grabtür, a pillar of a doorpost from inside a grave, not a stele or a tablet. He can't allocate a time or era to it and gives the name and profession in hieroglyphs and a remark Vorsteher der Steinbruchabeiter, or chief or foreman of quarry workers. Looking at the details, we see that there are three parts in the inscription regarding the name and the title. So you first have the name, then you have Amun, and then chief of the quarry workers. Now the first and third part are used and translated by Bouquet, but the middle part is omitted. Is it because it would disqualify our foreman from being close to the ruling pharaoh or and some 500 kilometers away from Cairo? Just asking. Ryshinsky is highly experienced and does not even find it necessary to mention the fact that the hyphen H is indeed an abbreviation for Retep. He also does not see the necessity of translating the rest of the inscription as they are standard offering formulas for the dead person. And this is the translation of the entire text. Is there anything in here indicative of a relationship of any kind with the pharaoh? Nope. Bouquet simply makes this up and Yahya and Islamic Awareness simply copy it. For further references, you can read about these offerings here, the Ramesside inscriptions translated and annotated by Kenneth Anderson Kitchen. Finally, the claim regarding building using baked bricks. Well, if you read Spencer's Brick Architecture in Ancient Egypt, we see that bricks were usually used to build smaller buildings and used mud bricks, and that during the Ramesside area, buildings made from baked bricks were an absolute rarity, let alone in huge monuments. Also, no evidence for the construction of a monumental tower has ever been found, even though the Quran suggests that building actually started. Let's come to the conclusion. No name matching Haman has been found in Egyptian inscriptions or other materials. 
The grave of a foreman of a quarry hundreds of miles from Cairo who was buried with good wishes for his personally preferred god, the falcon god Chemen, was used as an excuse to falsify evidence to make it the stele in memory of Haman, the chief builder and close ally of an unnamed pharaoh. Reality shows that the name does not match, the title does not match, the profession does not match, the book cited as proof does not exist, the museum cited as proof does not exist. An unnamed expert has to provide basic information. Hardly anything in this claim resembles the truth. Both Islamic Awareness and Harun Yahya have toned down their claims over the years using the Mafia method of only accepting and admitting what is an absolute must and unavoidable. You can see some of the versions in Appendix 4 on the pages of Answering Islam. In addition, there are indications in the form of emails sent by Islamic Awareness to various people begging them to confirm their assumptions, which never happened. On the contrary, when one of the cited experts on the pronunciation of the H's in the inscription, Professor Jürgen Orsing, found out about their attempts to falsify his text also, he wrote an open letter to them, chastising their dishonesty and ripping their claims apart. The German text for this is also in the description box. This means that in spite of their knowing full well that the entire construction by Bouquet is false, they still keep other Muslims misinformed and misled. Is this what an honest Muslim should do to other Muslims? Thank you for your time and patience.